reading to you from Titus, second chapter, 23rd verse. That the aged men be sober, grave, tempered, sound in faith, in charity and patience, sound <clears throat> the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, teachers of good things. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this evangelist Cecil Moe. And as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic, gave my heart to Christ over 55 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington. One year later, God called me to preach, and I've been sharing Jesus ever since. Well, friends, continue to pray for our health. We're still struggling, but we have a wonderful Savior that knows how to heal bodies. Well, listen, I'll be with you for a half an hour tonight. I wish you'd just kick off your slippers, sit back and relax. Pour your glass iced tea or a lemonade or a cup of coffee. Let's see what the Lord has for us, okay? Well, I've got my glass of lemonade, and I've got my Bible, and I think it's time we get busy. We've labeled this message, Why Christ Must Return. Turn with me to the first chapter of Luke. Let's begin reading with the 67th verse. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and the reminder, uh, uh, his, remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways." <clears throat> to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, uh, through the tender mercy of our to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet unto the way of peace. Well, friends, <clears throat> why Christ must return? All of the promises of the prophets must be fulfilled. Now, many prophets prophecies, I should say, about Jesus was fulfilled in his birth in Bethlehem. And many prophecies about Jesus was fulfilled in his death and resurrection. But some prophecies about Jesus remain unfulfilled. We have many promises that Christ would return, all right? Here's one of them, John 14, 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Well, then we also have the promises of the angels, Acts 1, 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye may, uh, you men of Galilee, why stand ye 
gazing up into the heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you unto heaven, so shall he so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into the heavens. And then we have the promise of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Well, why must Christ return? Well, Christ must return to complete his work in the nations. You know, friends, why Jesus is going to come back a, like a thief in the night? Well, if everybody knew the minute that Jesus would bust the clouds and stand with outstretched arms saying, Come unto me, all ye labor and heavy laden, everybody would get saved. Everybody would repent. But that's not the way it's going to happen. He will come as a thief in the night. Two will be in bed. One will be taken and the other one will be stay behind. Can you imagine what will happen when uh, the rapture comes? Here's an airplane full of 250 people. And we have a pilot and a co-pilot, both born-again believers. Do you know what that plane's going to do? It's going to crash. But those two will go on to be to heaven. It's dangerous to put all salvation, beloved. I, You say, well, Cecil, you know, I, I, I guess... I guess I'd be saved if I believed I had to be saved. Well, you don't have to be saved. No, you don't. But if your plans are going to heaven, then you better receive Christ as Savior. Now, well, see, I belong to a church. Well, that's fine. That's commendable. But that's not enough to get you into heaven. You say, well, I was baptized when I was a little baby. That's not going to get you to heaven. Baptism won't get you into heaven, whether you're a baby or an adult. You say, well, I'm living a good life. I pay my bills. I don't beat my wife and kids. Listen, friends. It tells us in the scriptures in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For instance, if it were possible, if it were possible for you to live a good life trying to live by the Ten, Ten Commandments, which you can't do, or try to live by the law, which you can't do, and you go to heaven, if you could do that, God made a terrible, terrible mistake. But he didn't make a mistake. He sent his son Jesus to pay for our sins on the cross. Well, you say, but he was sinless. That's correct. Christ was sinless, the only Son of God. But when, he, when they nailed him on that cross, he became sin. He took your sin, he took my sin upon him, and died. And while he was on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You say, did he do it? Yeah. Why? Because God is a holy, righteous God and could not look on sin. And Jesus was sin that, for that time. Oh, my dear friends. The scriptures concerning his work in the nations must be fulfilled in the prophet. The prophets wrote of his atoning work. Now, they wrote of his death in Psalm 22. Now, let's see, Psalm 22. All right, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer this thine holy one to see corruption. Thou shalt show me the path of life and the, and the persevere in fullness of joy. At the right hand there are pleasures forever. Well, <clears throat> they wrote of his resurrection. And also... The prophets also wrote about his coming kingdom. The prophecies had to do 
with Israel and other nations. Now, many of these prophecies of his kingdom are not fulfilled. Absolutely. Zacharias prophesied the conquest of Israel's enemies. Luke 1, 70, 74. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to, f to perform the, many prom the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. Friends, the Bible tells us the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And you know the Lord uses that word fear many times. Fear not, for I am with you. And I've told you before, every time I go in for an operation, I'd hear that still little voice, Fear not, Cecil, for I am with thee. Oh, my friends, what a comforting thought that God will be with you no matter where you are tonight. Maybe you're doing something that's wrong. And if you are, the Holy Spirit's tapping you on the heart and saying, Son, daughter, now you, need to do what you need to do. You need to turn from your sin. Tell me what you did, and I'll throw them in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be removed again. What kind of a God is that that would forgive us? And folks, you know and I know not one of us are perfect. Oh, my, you know we're not. We are not perfect. Well, Christ must return to complete his work in nature. You know, Christ exercised authority over nature during his ministry. He stilled the raging sea. Oh, dear friends, let me tell you something. That must have been a horrible experience we spoke on this the other day. And those disciples were beside themselves. They were scared out of their skin. And that old sea was raging and the ship was filling up with water. And Jesus was asleep in the back part of the ship on the stern. He was sound asleep. Well... Then he called out, and he said, Oh, you men of little faith, you know what? And he just said, Peace be still, and what happened? The sea quit. The sea quit. No longer was it a raging sea, but there was a calm. I want to ask you, dear friends, is a raging sea going in your life? Now, here's what he said. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. You know, there's nothing more rewarding for a preacher who's preaching. And they think they got a good message, that they're up there, and all of a sudden they lose their trend of thought. I've done that many, many times in prison. And my quartet or my wife would say, I'd say, whoa, what was I talking about? Well, what? And they'd say, you were talking about so-and-so. Oh, yeah, that's right. I said, that's why I bring those people with me to remind me what I've forgot. No, uh, uh, that's not a sign of fidelity because you forget things, but sometimes we certainly do. Now, the Bible tells us in John six nineteen that he actually walked on the water. So when they had rode about five or twenty or thirty furlongs, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. Well, I guess it would kind of give you a little start. But there he was, walking on the water. You know, there's a lot of preachers kind of think they walk on the water. Well, they can if there's ice underneath it. No, we preachers don't walk on the water. You know what we are, or what all Christians are, we're messengers. We're instruments. Our job is to share this wonderful Jesus who walked on the water, who stilled the raging sea. We're to tell people about him. Now, uh, Ken Jackson's a, a pastor friend of mine, and Brother Ken had the same operation that I had. 
Well, he had no problem with his, but I'm having all kinds of problems with mine. And I don't understand it, but that's okay. It's different things. Different strokes for different folks. Well, anyway, Christ exercised authority over nature at his death. Now, the Bible tells us the sun was darkened, Mark 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. When Christ returns to establish his kingdom, the earth will be fruitful. This is off the subject, but I was driving by a bar the other day, and men and women are standing out there, drunk out of their mind. I just had to bow my head and say, Oh, God, thank you so much for delivering me from the curse of alcoholism. See, Jesus can do that for you tonight. You might be an alcoholic. You might be a drug addict. You might be a homosexual, a lesbian, or you might be a, a whoremonger. And God can deal with that. Really, if you come to him as a little child and say, God, I am so sick and tired of my wayward life, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. And you invite him into your heart. I'm going to tell you a little story. He will deliver you. Now, I mean deliver you. You say, well, how long does it take to get sober? Hey, immediately. When did Zacchaeus get saved when he dropped out of that sycamore tree? Somewhere between the time he dropped off that limb until the time he hit the ground. It was instantaneous. You know, I remember one time I was preaching a revival in my big old gospel tent. And this farmer, this dairyman stood up and he said, uh, Glory to God, I got saved last night. I said, uh, well, tell us about it. Well, he said, I was milking this big old Guern Guernsey cow. No, it wasn't a Guern Holstein. And she kicked me. I said, oh. Well, he said, by the time I hit the gutter, I, I, I was saved. I said, did you repent? And he said, no. I said, sit down. Beloved, there is no salvation without repentance. That's godly sorrow for our sins. Because the Bible tells us in 323 Romans, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, now... You say, well, what does that mean? Just exactly what it said. We have all sinned. We have the Adamic nature that Adam and Eve had when they were cast forth out of the garden. They disobeyed God. He said, you can have any fruit you want in this whole place, but don't you touch that tree. But Eve went over there, got a little suspicious, went over there, and guess what happened? She took of the fruit. And then she got herself in a whole lot of trouble. Well, <clears throat> Christ must return to complete his work in new believers. Christ began a good work in us at our conversion. And I know you say, well, I don't know. Yes, he did. Now, we are made new creations, creatures. Second Corinthians 5.17 that therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become as new. You see, the thing is, you, uh, you, you no longer believe that way that you used to believe. Oh, friends, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that, that that is in the Scriptures. You say, well, why? Well, because my wife, she had a terrible time. She thought that she lived a good moral life, and that was enough. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, and you're all right. Well, I know, I know some other people used to believe that way, but when the Holy Spirit of God got a hold of them, they changed that. Because you can't live a moral life and plan on getting into heaven. 
<clears throat> the Bible says the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And then he goes on, we embark on God's great plan for our lives. And here's a scripture, my dear friends, that you and I all have problem with. Romans 8 to 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them which are called according to his purpose. Yes, God had a plan and you and I and who know Jesus are in it. Yes, you do. Can you imagine? You say, you mean God's concerned about me? You sure is. We are net, not yet what we ought to be. We are still works in progress. God is not through with us yet. When Christ returns, we will be like him. Now, the Christ of Christmas is coming again. He's preparing us for that great day. Let me ask you, are you ready for Christ's return? Beloved, you know, when I was in the Navy, <clears throat> I, uh, we had, to, had a book called The Blue Jack's Manual. And I was reading that one day, and I was telling that I was, I was homesick, and I'd, I didn't like a lot of things the Navy wasn't making us do. Well, it was for our own good. One day it said, you're going to be in battle. And uh, because you learn to follow orders, you'll save your life. And sure enough, our ship was out in the South Pacific and our engine broke down. And we was out there all floating all by ourselves. No destroyers, no nothing to protect us. And they sounded general quarters in less than three minutes from the time they sounded GQ. Every man was on his battle station. Every man was on his gun station. All of us phone talkers were ready for battle because we knew how to take orders. You know why we go through a lot of problems as Christians? Because he is training us to be better soldiers. But most of all, I want to ask you tonight, have you, have you really thought about dying and going to heaven? Well, that's one, that's one thing I wouldn't talk about to anybody when I was lost. I was so afraid that when I died, I was going to hell. And I was the way I was going as an alcoholic. The Bible said no drunkard's going to go to heaven unless you've been converted. If you haven't been converted and there's a tugging at your old heart tonight, would you bow your head with me? And I wouldn't want you to pray this prayer unless you mean it. And here's how it goes. Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me for all my sins. And Lord, I'm opening my heart and receiving you as my personal Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, get on the phone. Call 303-471-8534. I'll not use your name on the air. I won't embarrass you. I sure won't sit down and write and ask you for any money. And I don't care where you go to church. I'm only concerned where you spend eternity. Don't be afraid to give me a call. 303 303- Four seven one eight five three four. If you can't afford to call, call me collect, and I'll accept the charge. Well, friends, for the past half hour, your host has been Evangelist C. Simone. I want to thank you for listening, dear friends. Oh, my friends, I want you to know God loves you. I know you're going through some tough times, so am I. But he loves us. He careth for us. Peter said, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And he sure does. Well, listen, you say, well, Cecil, 
Well, you know, I'd like to talk to you personally. Well, just get on the phone and call me, 303-471-8534. I won't jump on you. If you want to ask me a question, I don't know the answer, and I don't know all the answers, I'll guarantee I'll find it for you. Because all the things that you need to know in life is in this book, this God's Holy Unerring Word. Well, friends, until this time next Sunday night, we ask for your prayers. And I want you to be stay sweet, keep looking up, for this wonderful, wonderful Jesus is coming soon. Good night, and may God bless you real, real good 